you know that you've made it big when somebody introduces you with only one name. So I'm like Madonna and Cher now, that he doesn't have to mention my last name. Uh, so thank you for all being here and for uh, waiting to the last talk. I, I can't promise you that I'll be as exciting as uh, Nomadic Massive or as Owen with his mash, mashing up, but I'll, I'll try to keep you entertained. So basically the past 15 years or so I've been uh, trying to infuse evolutionary psychology into the study of consumption. Uh, the idea being that Sorry, is it? The idea being that if you look at these faces, of course there are very, very important cross-cultural differences uh, that, that define these people, but underneath these, these differences, there's a bed of human universals that are very much rooted in our common shared human nature. And so to quote E.O. Wilson, the famous Harvard evolutionary biologist, he said that the genes hold culture on a leash, to which I would simply add the genes hold consumer behavior on a leash. So, of course, uh, culture is malleable, but it is malleable within our biological constraints. Uh, so this idea of nature versus nurture is one that has come up in many, many different fields, many different contexts. Are charismatic leaders, leaders born or are they made? So in the context of consumer behavior, I'll give you one such example. So toy preferences is typically the example that social scientists use to demonstrate that we are socialized to be consumers. So little Johnny plays with the... Uh, blue truck aggressively, while little Lind Linda plays with uh, the pink doll in a very nurturing way. And it is this cascade of gender socialization that eventually leads us to be little boy, uh, you know, grown up males or females. It turns out that that's not quite so accurate, so let me just very briefly discuss a few findings that demonstrate that some of these preferences are actually quite innate. Children who are in the pre socialization stage, meaning that they don't yet have the cognitive development to be socialized, also display these sex-specific uh, toy preferences. Uh, little girls who suffer from uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is an endocrinological disorder that masculinizes little girls, they tend to then have sex preferences, I mean, toy preferences that are very much like little boys. And then if you do studies with other, some of our cousins, primate cousins, uh, rhesus monkeys and vervet monkeys, they have very much the same sex-specific toy preferences. So that puts a bit of a damper on the idea that we are just empty minds who are subsequently socialized. And if you're wondering why the baby is extremely beautiful, that's because of the beauty of my wife who's here in the room. <laughs> that's, a, that's a belated uh, Valentine's gift. Now, I, now that puts me, I don't have to pay her any fancy uh, you know, flowers and so on. Uh, to, to give you a sense of how powerful evolutionary psychology is in understanding even you know, daily events, I'll just share one example continuing with the story of my little daughter. So when uh, my wife was pregnant with our daughter Luna, of course we got the requisite uh, two months ultrasound, we put it up very proudly on the refrigerator, uh, mother-in-law came over with, uh, with my father-in-law, and she looks at these images. Now, these images, I should point out, they could be those of a lizard, they could be those of an amoeba, they could be those of an alien, yet she looks at it and arrestingly says, oh my God, God, the baby looks exactly like you. <laughs> he has your profile, can't you see? Now, why would that be related to evolutionary psychology? Well, it turns out that when children are born around the world, right? So this is not specific to Peruvian culture or Israeli culture. It's very much a human universal. When, when kids are born, usually the, the mother's side of the family will very, very quickly proclaim that the newborn baby looks exactly like the father. The reason for that is because it's a mechanism, it's a cultural mechanism to try to assuage you know, threats of paternity uncertainty. But in this case, this is the first scientific case where this mechanism happened in utero. So I've, so I've already made my daughter famous even before she could at that point speak or think. Uh, so for the rest of the talk today, I'll, I'll talk about uh, some of the research that I've been doing uh, uh, linking how our survival instinct manifests itself in consumer behavior and then also our reproductive instinct. So if here, of course, food is probably, uh, you know, the, 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 the consumption act that is most closely linked to our survival. So if you look at the hummingbird, he, he has to eat roughly 1.5 to three times its body weight per day 
because of its high metabolism in order to be able to survive. So he's got a good reason why he has to eat so much. On the other hand, uh, all you can eat buffets, all you can have uh, vacation packages, super size meals, cater to the same instinct of hoarding and gorging. Unfortunately, we don't have his metabolic rate, so we end up with these dreadful diseases. Uh, continuing with the same uh, line of thinking, uh, we have this incredible innate preference for fatty foods. Few of us prefer raw broccoli to chocolate mousse or to a juicy steak. So if you look here at the grizzly bears, they're eating fatty salmon uh, you know, prior to going into semi-hibernation. Uh, if you look at the top 10 restaurants around the world, they have one thing in common. They deliver fatty foods to us uh, that, is taste, that is tasty. It's not that they, they have good advertisements. It's not that they have nice jingles. It's that they deliver a product that is perfectly congruent with our evolved taste buds. And this is exactly what the Atkins diet did, right? The Atkins diet did said, hey, look, you could eat as much as you want fatty steak, uh, eggs, you could eat bacon, and you're going to lose weight. Great, sign me up, right? Interestingly, though, cross-cultural differences in culinary traditions are also themselves due to biology. So if you look at cultures that are predominantly meat-based, so look at the top uh, smoked meat sandwich, or predominantly vegetable-based, or how much spices are used in a culinary tradition, how much salt consumption is used, uh, how much pickling happens in a culture, each of these culinary traditions turn out to be adaptations to the local environment. And what specifically, it's correlated to the latitude of the country, which is of course correlated to the ambient temperature, which is correlated to the density of the food pathogens in that culture. So rather than simply saying that here we have an example of, oh, it's due to culture, an evolutionary approach allows you to understand what is the ultimate explanation for that cultural difference. Uh, moving on to mating, something that I think everybody here would be interested in. Uh, if you look at uh, the cardinal, he's engaging in what's called nuptial gift giving. In many species, you, give, you offer a gift. The male cardinal, if you see, he's got a food morsel in his mouth. He's saying, hey, look, I can provide for you. And as a, as a measure of how well I can provide for you, how about you, get, you grant me sexual access to, to you? And of course, we engage in endless forms as consumers in exactly this behavior. Uh, the diamond rings that we have to offer have to be a costly signal. Otherwise, the ladies wouldn't be able to you know, assort the difference between the faker and the true suitor. Therefore, I have to pay 25% of my yearly income to show you that I am truthful. And hopefully then, you will give it up just like the female cardinal. <laughs> we use products as sexual signals, right? So if you look at the peacock over here, he's, uh, the, the hen seems to be rather uninterested. And he's saying, look at my tail. Look how big it is. Look how symmetric it is. Look how iridescent the colors are. This is why you have to choose me, because my phenotypic quality is so great. Well, I've argued in... Uh, in several of my books, that uh, consumers do exactly that, right? Many times we use products, either men or women, to improve our position in the mating market. So a few years ago with one of my former graduate students, John Vangas, we decided to test this idea. We brought in people into, uh, not people, we brought in males into the lab, and we had them drive either a fancy, it's not imagine driving a Porsche, they actually drove a Porsche or they drove a beaten up, uh, rusted old sedan in one of two environments, either in downtown Montreal where everybody could see you, or in a semi-deserted highway. By the way, try to get a granting agency to release money and convince them that you're not going to use the Porsche for your own personal sinister pursuits. <laughs> now, what were some of the dependent measures? At the end of each of these conditions, these driving conditions, we, we collected salivary assays which then help us measure their fluctuations in their testosterone levels. And what do you think happened? When you put young males in the Porsche, the endocrinological response is outlandish. Now, <laughs> now we had thought that, yes, testosterone would go up in both environments, but it would go up a lot more when everybody could see you. So in downtown Montreal, it will go up a lot more than on the semi-deserted highway. The guys couldn't give a damn, put me in a Porsche, their testosterone <laughs> shot through the roof. Uh, just to continue with this point, cars as sexual signals, uh, continuing with that theme, this is a study that was done two years ago by some British psychologists. 
Uh, these are the actual stimuli that they use. You, you take the same guy, you put him either in a Ford Fiesta, beaten up old car, or in a Bentley, and you ask women to rate this guy in terms of how physically attractive he is. You're not talking about his status, just physically how beautiful is this man. And you do the same thing with the woman, and men have to judge it. Men couldn't give a damn the car that the lady, that the lady was driving. On the other hand, the women, when the guy is in the Bentley, oh my God, he's Brad Pitt. When he is driving in the other car, oh no, I don't like losers like this, okay? <laughs> so again, it shows you how these products are quite intoxicating in terms of how it, it helps us position ourselves in the mating market. Of course, not only men engage in sexual signaling, the ladies are also guilty of such pursuits. On the left-hand side, we've got a female baboon who's an estrus, uh, and she's an estrus and engaging in conspicuous advertising of her genitalia. I think I could speak safely for all men here that we would not want our human females to be conspicuously displaying their genitalia in this way. <laughs> but sticking true to the pink theme, what they certainly do do is that they will dress much more provocatively when they are maximally fertile in their menstrual cycle. So with one of my doctoral students who's here in the room, I can't see him because I'm blinded by the lights, Eric, St Eric Stenstrom, we've done a, a very, very thorough study where we've looked at how the menstrual cycle affects women's behaviors as consumers, one of which is how much do they engage in beautification as a function of whether they are in the luteal phase or the fertile phase of their menstrual cycle. Continuing on with this idea of sexual signaling, uh, a few years ago I had an undergraduate student who at the end of the course came to me and said, Professor Saad, I, I have to work with you. Could, you. could you hook me up with some project? I want to work, I want to do anything. So I thought about it for a while and I said, uh, is, this is a male student. I said, okay, well, how about if I were to give you the following project? You're going to surf porn sites for the next one month. <laughs> to which he looked at me, and his eyes told me, Professor Saad, I love you. <laughs> so what was the point of the project, basically? I wanted to test whether the, what evolutionary psychologists have talked about, this idea of a preference for the hourglass figure, which is a waist-to-hip ratio of 0.7, whether I could actually pick it out by doing a content analysis of how female escorts advertise themselves on the internet. So typically, you know, my height is five foot three, here are my measurements, here's my weight, here's my fee. And so what I had this uh, uh, very lucky male uh, undergraduate student do is just surf different sites he ended up gathering data of more than 1,000 female escorts. <laughs> from, from, right, he, he was really assiduous in his pursuit of science. Uh, and it covered 48 different countries. So nobody could say, oh, but this is a Western standard. Oh, it's due to the Oprah effect. It's due to Cosmopolitan magazine. We specifically chose cultures that were extraordinarily di disparate in terms of the different metrics that a culture might be defined on. And it turns out that the average waist-to-hip ratio is exactly in line with what is expected from an evolutionary perspective. Men like uh, a waist-to-hip ratio that signals nobility and fertility. So, uh, continuing very, very briefly, uh, how do some of these sex differences that I've been talking about manifest themselves in other settings? Well, if you were a paleontologist and you wanted to study the, the evolution of a species, well, you typically would have gone through skeletal remains, you might go through the fossil records, and then that would allow you to, to reconstruct the phylogenetic history of a species. Well, of course, our minds don't fossilize, and so we have to find some alternate fossil record. And so what I've argued is that we could turn to cultural products as our fossil records, because cultural products are ultimately created by human minds. And so we could do a content analysis on these cultural products to help us identify some of the evolutionary forces that would have led to the evolution of the human mind. So uh, romance novels are almost exclusively read by women around the world, whether you're from Peru or Egypt or Montreal, it's read by women. Uh, if you, for example, look at the male archetype, the male hero, it's almost identical across all romance novels. He's never a short, hourglassed beta male who's afraid of his shadow. He's larger than life, he's tall, he's muscular, he's a neurosurgeon or a king or a prince. That's because that particular product caters to women's evolved fantasies. On the other hand, hardcore pornography 
doesn't exist because there is a patriarchal conspiracy to demean women. It exists because it caters to a particular penchant in men. And so if you want to understand some of these sex differences, look at these cultural products that are very successful, and you really understand quite a bit, not only about our commonalities, but also about our differences. Next, since we've had a massive, nomad, nomadic massive, and Owen talking about music, this is particularly apropos. If you look at songs, they're a fantastic stimulus for looking at some of these sex differences. So the things that men and women sing about are perfectly congruent with universal mating preferences. So around the world, men tend to place a lot more value on youth and physical beauty in prospective mates, and around the world, women place a lot more value on social status of men. Therefore, if you look at the left-hand uh, examples, all of these top songs, uh, so Gwen Guthrie, Destiny's Child, TLC, and Marina Shaw, they're denigrating men for having low social status. If you think you're going to get with me and you don't have any money, walk away, idiot. Okay, I'm not interested in you. Okay? There are no songs that say, hey, Linda, you're not working hard at school. I won't have sex with you. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I feel like I'm a, a comic up here. Uh, and of course, when men sing about social status, they then show off. I've got the goods, I've got the Aston Martin. Uh, there's a million songs, Money in the Bank. I mean, literally, there's at least 10 different artists, hip-hop artists, that have the exact same title, I've got money in the bank, you want to get with me. <laughs> Look at the, on the right-hand corner, the way that men and women navigate in terms of their sexuality in their song lyrics is drastically different. So Mickey Gilly, who's a... Uh, uh, a country music star from the mid-70s had a song called Don't the Girls All Get Prettier at Closing Time. In other words, the girl that men are willing to sleep with at 11 o'clock is very different from the creature that they're willing to <laughs> satisfy with at 3 in the morning. You don't have too many songs that say don't the guys get more handsome at closing time precisely because the cost of making a suboptimal mating choice looms much larger for women. That's not due to socialization, that's due to a basic biological reality called parental investment theory. Same thing for physical attractiveness, it's almost always the case. And by the way, it's not only true in English songs, it's not hip hop or English or soul songs, you could do Hindi songs and, and Arabic songs and you'll find the exact same phenomena. So in conclusion, exactly on time, uh, T. Dobzhansky, who was a famous evolutionary geneticist, said that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Well, I would slightly tweak that and say nothing in consumer behavior could ever make sense without an understanding of our evolutionary heritage. Thank you very much.